the seats. Good morning, family of God. Hallelujah. There were a lot more people last night for Andre. <laughs> Hallelujah. I want to From Genesis to Revelation, there is much reference to prophecy almost in every single page of your Bible. There will be something about prophecy and prophets and prophetic utterance and prophetic gestures and, and all kinds of things. So we can't escape prophecy or prophetic ministry gifting in the world. It's, it's very evident. It's real. It's part of your life. But we are not led by prophecy. For you to be healthy spiritually... You have to, first of all, have an intimate relationship ongoing with the Lord. You may think that's very understandable or acceptable or without, that goes without saying, but Jesus made it clear that we have to remain in Him. You can be working for God all your life and miss the mark. Jesus said in that day, you'll say, didn't we prophesy in your name, heal the sick and cast out devils? And you'll say, I don't know you. I don't want any child of God to be in that position that, Lord doesn't know you because there's no constant relationship. And in your relationship with God, the first thing, you must have to be healthy. The second thing is you must be versed in the Word of God. The written Bible is God's clear parameters. And what the Bible is no more than prophesying through people but has been tested for centuries and thousands of years constantly written by, used by many different people, and people have set out to disprove the Bible only to become believers. It has never been anyone on this planet that's been able to disprove or discredit the Bible. It has always proved itself and still the number one seller in the world today in most read book, the Bible. It's the life-giving source. It's undeniably the Word of God. So it needs to be something that we in America need to embellish. I, I, try, or I need to embrace. I mean, I really appeal to you to get an audio. We have so much available to us. Get an audio version of the, of the Bible and let it play in the background wherever you are. Instead of listening to, to music that's boring and have no life in it, make sure the word's running in the background. It'll feed your spirit such healthy things. Then the third thing is to be healthy, you have to be part of a local church. The older I become, since, and since I was a, ch since a young person in the ministry, I am fully convinced you can never be spiritually healthy or balanced if you don't participate in a local church. You can't go once a month. It's not going to help. You have to be really involved in the family of God. It is as God's spiritual way. He initiated the church for that reason. We are family, and whether you like it or not, we're stuck together. We can't choose. giving a year it's all we can handle at a time <laughs> but in the church we meet together and we have iron will sharpen iron and you have all kinds of experiences but are all designed to help us grow and we God knows what we need for eternity now they're the gifts of the Holy Spirit that are for a purpose the gifts are to strengthen and encourage the, those in the church the fivefold ministries to equip the saints we have the third tier which no one ever talks about Paul talks to the Corinthians, he says in 1 Corinthians 12, he says there are different gifts by the same Spirit, there are different ministries by the same Spirit, and then thirdly he says there are different effects but by the same Spirit. The effect is every church has a special call or a application. Some churches are mission-minded, some churches are prophetic, some churches are very targeted at certain kinds of communities. This church has been used of God to touch, and it's always been a prophetic church. God's always used the prayers of this family, and that during your prayer time, things were journaled all the time that have made a major effect. It's undeniable how the, we can see the evidence and the fruit of these ongoing things, what some people think is normal and average is definitely not common. The most uh, alarming thing for me in this church has always been since I've, and I've been coming here since you were just a hundred and odd people in squash courts, and you've grown so consistently over the years. What's been so alarming to me is how consistent people are in this church, that people are dedicated and how very few people leave. They only leave because they have a job somewhere else, something, circumstance changes. It's not common. The most common thing in the church is to lose about 70% of your population revolves. It's a very normal, statistically, very 
very common. But this church has a very high percentage of people that remain. I've never seen such strange things like that. And the love of God in this house has been so powerfully evident. You don't go to an average church. You go to a way above average. It is, for as far as I'm concerned, one of the most phenomenal churches in the world. Uh, there's no doubt in my mind. Now, the prophetic has a role to play, and we have to put it in its rightful place. We cannot underplay it, or we cannot overplay it. We're not led by prophecy, but it has a role to play. And the most prominent evidence of prophecy is to strengthen, encourage you, and enhance your relationship with the Lord. It's not there to be a fortune-telling or a guidance. The Holy Spirit is what leads you. We are led by the Spirit, and so we are called the sons of God. But there is a role for prophecy as a gift to play. In fact, let me give it, make it very clear and put it in perspective for you. Of the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit, it is the one single gift that is singled out that we ought to desire more than all the other gifts. And the reason is because all the gifts that you see function will come and go, and if you get physically healed supernaturally, it is fantastic. But when you physically go on to be the Lord, you've left all that behind you. The only gift that goes with you to eternity is prophecy. Every word you get, the grass withers, the flower fades, but His word will stand forever. His word never returns to him void. So prophecy is really from the Holy Spirit and from God will always stay with you regardless of how your circumstance change. His word does not return void. It, the heaven and earth passes away, Jesus said, but his word will stand forever, whatever he said. And words are extremely powerful. The older I become, the more conscious I am of what we speak and how words affect every single thing in our lives. And when you are spiritual and you are used of God, your words are even more powerful and you have to watch carefully what you say. Jesus, our Lord and Savior, who we follow, we don't follow Paul, we don't follow Peter or John, we follow Jesus. We learn from the disciples, but we follow Jesus. We are called disciples of Jesus. We are called Christians. We follow Christ. Is that correct? And we've, we've listened to him and what he teaches. He said that for every idle word, you will give an account. For a word that has no effect of no life in it, you will have to answer for that. That's how important it is for us to make sure we say the right things. And I was thinking last night when I was, when, uh, yesterday at lunchtime when I was visiting with Pastor Rhonda. You know, Pastor Rhonda is a very verbal person. There's no question that you have to wonder what she's thinking or what's going on because she will, and she, she tells you a lot of information. And, but when I was thinking, listen to her yesterday, uh, listen, listen to her yesterday, I, really, I reminded myself that in all the years I've known, I've never, not one time heard something I thought she should not have said or gossiped about someone or had a negative word. Not one single time. I don't know how one can do that because the scripture says, you laugh, but this proverb says that where there are many words, sin is not far off. For someone to be that powerful in word control and control their spirits, they must be in harmony with the Holy Spirit. And I'm saying that with respect and, and regard and, and awe, awe of someone that can do that, that can communicate in such a great level and so much and be so careful, so very careful. I've never, and I've been in situations where I've tried to get, get information out of her about situations and people and, and ministers and things. You will not, she won't even react. Her face will not give a thing away. It's remarkable. It is remarkable. Of course, her husband doesn't give anything away. There's no movement at all in his face. He could play poker and you'd lose, I can guarantee you. <laughs> so you're very blessed. So words are very powerful. Now, prophecy has a role to play in your life. And our, the right attitude and approach to it will determine how much of that you can benefit by. So first of all, let me tell you how to receive prophecy. The, and if you write and make a notes, this is where you start. The first thing you make sure is you get the recording. We are blessed to have recording equipment because I guarantee you that you've heard half of it incorrectly and the other half you didn't hear, you didn't hear at all. Because it happens so fast and sometimes the anointing is so powerful, one thing will stand out and all the other things you didn't hear. And even the one thing you hear, you didn't hear it right. It's very common, even the disciples misunderstood or misheard what Jesus prophesied. In John 21... Jesus prophesies over Peter and tells him that when you're young, 
You dress yourself, but when you are old, someone else will lead you. And so Peter's not impressed with that word because it didn't suit him. A lot of words you get from God at the time have no bearing, no effect, no impact. You wonder what in the world? I don't know. That. I don't want that word. But God knows what he's doing because he sees the end from the beginning. And Peter needed that word. And so Jesus said, told Peter, you'll be old. And the very first words out of Peter's mouth wasn't, well, could you tell me more? What's going to happen to my ministry? No. What about John? What about John? He's more concerned about what's, what kind of prophecy John's going to get. And so Jesus responds to him and says, what is it to you? How's it your business if I keep him till I come? And the Bible says in John 21, a rumor spread that John was not going to die. They misunderstood what he said. He didn't say that he would not die. He just said, what is it to you if I keep him? And so they misunderstood. They didn't quite get the details, and John was correcting it in his gospel. So for you to be sure you didn't mishear it, make sure you get the recording, and more than listen to it again, write it down. I'll tell you why. In my experience, when you read it, you see so much more than when you hear it. So you use all your senses, and it's, as you're writing it out, it makes so much more logic to you. Now, I can imagine if our president came to this room today, and he spoke... Even just for one minute, you would remember every single word, how he said his, his expressions, everything about what he said. But when God the Almighty speaks to you, you dismiss it so fast looking for the next word. And I'm here to tell you, your attitude has to be, well, if it's God, let's pay attention. Because it's that important. So he's more important than your president. Would you agree with that? Okay, now you understand. So now we get the recording, we write it down, and make sure we understood it correctly. Now, very often we don't understand all of it, and I hear the expression, put it on a shelf. I don't know what that means. It's not even biblical. I do find that Mary's response to prophecy, and this is very important, and she got a prophecy that didn't relate to her or make any sense. He t- God told her she was going to be pregnant, wasn't even married yet. If I prophesy to married couples, they're going to have a baby. They panic often, and they married. Mary's response was, let it be to me according to your will. If it's your will, whatever you want. Now, you may think that's common amongst us, but I promise you it is absolutely not common. Most of us in this room will do many things God asks, but there are definitely things we would be uncomfortable with. I thought that I would do everything God said when on my way to Israel one time from Johannesburg to do a conference in the 90s to celebrate. Figure out. Or his behavior or the way he looked or his genetics. He was really in every way a strange throwback. Yet the Lord said, he's a man after my own heart, and thank God it's in the Scriptures in Acts 13, 22. Why? And God says, I gave David as a son of Jesse, as a man after my own heart, because he will do everything I ask him. And I thought that would be me too. I would do everything you ask me. And God says, you don't even hear half the things, let alone do them. And I found out very clearly we don't really hear. In fact, If some things we get a prophecy about, we like and we grasp and we'll do. Other things we, well, I don't know about that. I need a confirmation. For example, should I prophesy to you now that each one of you should give $1,000 in the offering, you'd want and need and demand a sign, a fleece, a confirmation, or two or three. But if I prophesied you all to go to a rebound vacation, you wouldn't want a confirmation. (laughs) Just in case. You want to go, it it suits your flesh. We are all like that, not just one person. And we are learning and growing to become submissive to the Lord and yielded to. Now, Mary was at the age of 15. She said, did it be to me according to your will? And the Bible says she hid the word in her heart. And I wondered what that meant to hide the word in her heart. She took it seriously. She didn't publicly talk about it. She took it and she took it into her spirit, believed it, and she held it. She's going to not understand it all or process it but she's going to keep it to herself and understand what god is saying and often god expects you to have that very same attitude to put the word in your heart because it doesn't make sense today there are some words that god will speak to you that you just won't get today but you need it in a little while from now then it'll start falling into place for example 
Jesus said in Acts 6, 16, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. That's talking to disciples that he had a lot to tell them, but they weren't in any condition to hear it. For example, if I was with Moses going to Egypt, and I stood there and prophesied with him, he'd said, well, we're going to the land of milk and honey. I'd say, Moses, give me a chance to prophesy. And I'd say, that's true. Everything he's saying is a land that's blessed. But what he didn't prophesy is there's actually someone living there right now, and they're giants. They aren't normally they are above average size. They buy all their clothes and big and tall. It is one major challenge. If that's not all, I must also let you know that God says you'll reach a sea that's called the Red Sea. None of you have been there, but you've been slaves for generations in this place. And then you'll have no bridge, no ship, no way of getting across. So God, in his great goodness, will separate the ocean and cause walls of ocean to be on either side. And you'll go down to the bottom of the ocean, walking across at the bottom of an ocean. Do you know how strange that sounds? If I would prophesy that while they were in Egypt as slaves, they'd look at me and say, have you been smoking something? Because it doesn't make any sense then. But if I got to the Red Sea and then I prophesied it, they would grab it. There's a time that we grab words. And sometimes God will give you the word ahead of time because you need it already in the background when the time comes. Peter was in prison in Acts 12 chained between two soldiers, bound with, and they just killed James, and they want to kill him, and he's so relaxed, he's sleeping. The same personality that denied the Lord and was frantic about all kinds of things, the whole church is praying, he's sleeping, because Jesus said he'd be old. When he got, got the word he'd be old, it made no sense, didn't help him, didn't do a thing for him, but when he was in jail, oh, it was a precious word. It meant everything to him. It gave him the courage and the confidence as he believed what God said, that he could sleep and not stress about being killed, even though it looked that way because he'd heard what God had to say. Are you still with me now? So you have this timing that God gives you words sometimes that makes no sense. Rather than trash it, hide the word in your heart. You must test it and hide it. Now, when you get the prophecy and you've written it down, it's now time for you to first of all, understand what you can understand. If you don't understand it all, take it to someone you can that's a leader, that's a pastor, that's a home cell group leader, someone that knows you outside of your life because we see things one way and people see us in a different way. You often see your husband or wife will tell you that you're this way. No, I'm not, and you'll fight it because in your mind, you are what you think you want to be when you actually behave a different way. I teach my children that even though you feel indefensive and people accuse you of something, rather than thinking that you are innocent, why don't you figure out what it is that they makes them feel? Take the more godly we become. You know, in your journey with the Lord, there are different levels. And the two areas you'll always be tested is in your relationship with others and in your finances. Always God will take you higher and higher and higher. When you start out in serving the Lord, He expects you to forgive and then forgive those that offended you and they ask forgiveness, you release them finally. Then He asks you to forgive those that, that didn't even ask you. And then He asks you to forgive those that think that they the ones that are innocent and done harm and you are innocent and you know in your heart you did nothing wrong, but you have to forgive them and, and take the... Now, you go to another level, the more Christ-like and godly way is that you jump and seize the opportunity in a, in, a, in a discord to take the blame, even when if it's yours or not, you don't care. All you care about is being reconciled and in Christ's name be lifted up. Jesus himself took blame that wasn't his. So the ultimate Christ-like nature in relationship is to take the blame and to want to take it and mean it from your heart because all you care about is that the, the progress of God's kingdom and every person's life that they walk with the Lord, that there's, you will take all the blame and all the responsibility because you, you're just laying your life down. You will be amazed how often in every discord how you're trying to prove how right you are. In your marriage, most of your arguments are trying to prove that you're right. You think God cares? God doesn't care if you're right or not. First Corinthians eleven nineteen says there must be fighting amongst you in the church, that they that are proved of God can be seen. Because when you have a discord with someone, argument, fight, you have the right to be wrong even when you're right. And that's what God promotes. In fact, when God sees you more concerned about being reconciled than right, you're taking on his nature, he's watching to see what's inside of you. That's how he discerns. Is in those tense situations, God's watching who you really are. <laughs> Going very quiet. Okay, moving right along now. 
in the, in the prophetic, so once you've written it down and you've had people come and help you try and place it correctly in your life, because in the prophecy, the sentiments, the words are not vague, but they refer to moving. Now, for, for example, a moving. Are you moving job? Are you moving house? Are you moving church? Are you moving towns? Are you, what's moving? You have to apply it correctly in your life, and God doesn't tell you the whole detail because prophecy is never a fortune-telling or a storybook or a manual. Prophecy is an invitation to the perfect purposes of God because whether you understand this or not, we don't really want to fall into God's will completely. We say we do. We like God's will when it suits us, but we don't really understand it all, and we want to, and God cannot possibly explain to us. God's dumbed down the Bible as far as he can to help us that we can follow it because he's a God that makes universe after universe and is on a high level and we, we have to, in our small brains, try to understand some of that stuff and it's a comical that some prophets tell me they know what God's doing because they can't possibly know what God's doing. His ways are so much higher than man's ways. That's why we trust him. If we knew what God knew, we wouldn't need to trust him. So you've got to rely on him and trust him. He's working out the best that his word is true. He's not playing games with you. Now you're good. Now I'm going to bless you. Now you're doing bad. Now, no, it's not true. He's always good. And he never changes. He responds to faith, not how good you are. It's because you're not good that he had to die on the cross. But he does respond to faith. Faith really t- turns things loose in the heavenlies. And the devil's doing all he can to discredit your faith or to, to make it impotent to Break it down. Now, in your, in your prophesying or prophetic word you receive, once you've written it down, you start to understand the word. Now you have a promise of God or you have some future and you can really relate to it and you just witness with it. Or you've had two or three of the same prophecies. It hasn't happened yet. Now you have a role to play that's very important. It was an invitation to God's purpose and plan. And if you'll turn your Bibles to 1 Timothy 1.18, I'd like to read from you, read for you from there, 1 Timothy 1.18. Timothy was one of the several sons that, that Paul was very glad to have in his life, Timothy and Titus and these guys that he actually trained or treated. Please understand, sonship is very different to discipleship. Discipleship is where you're schooled and trained to do what you're called to do and what you're equipped to do, whereas a son is something very different. Are you listening to me? I'm going to stop and talk about that for a minute, just a minute, just to dump some things on you. There, there, are, there are 150 psalms, half of which are written by David. The other half are written by different authors, including Moses. But there are some psalms, a few, very few, written by Solomon. Now, in my mind and estimation, if Solomon was recorded or reputed to be one of the wisest men on the face of the earth, and he wrote a psalm, I'd pay careful attention to it, because that man's smart. And he wrote a psalm that you all know the first two of the five verses, but not the rest. And it's Psalm 127. You all know, unless God build a house, they that labor, labor in vain. You all know that verse. And the next one you know too. That's Solomon's writing. And the second verse says, early you rise and it's too late, laboring and so on. It's all in vain if God's not helping you. Now the third verse and the fourth and the fifth says, Blessed is he that has many sons in his youth. And it ends, the last verse is because when he contends with his enemy at the gate, his sons will stand with him. Spiritual sons, which is not a gender, it's male or female, because then it's a a different commitment, because the difference in sons and disciples are that sons inherit and sons take on the DNA of their father. You can be in this church and really blessed and be in many years and learn and grow and become wonderfully fruitful. But if you're a spiritual son, you'll take on the DNA of this leadership, have the same heart and same vision. It becomes a natural flow, a natural reproduction from you. You're reproducing what your DNA reproduces. You begin to take on the same shape, the same look, the same vision, the same form. Whether they're there or not, you are reproducing what they are because you are a spiritual son. You also are one that's entitled to inherit. The prodigal son's one son, younger son, asked for his inheritance because he could. He was fully aware that he was a son and not a disciple or a hireling. He had the right. No hireling or servant asked their master for money. 
but he could. He had a right to the inheritance because he understood that he was a son. If you understand that you are a spiritual son, there's certain anointing and blessing that comes down from the leadership that you follow or become a son to. A sonship is a commitment from you, like Elisha. Elisha followed Elijah. When Elijah had two prophetic schools, he was training 40, 40 different, 80 altogether, two different 40 groups of prophets. He was trained them as God gave instructions, and they were wonderful prophets. They're clear, they prophesied frequently, helped minister to all of Israel. But then God instructed him to go find this man plowing in the field, and he singled him out and put his mantle on him, which means now you have an anointing like mine. But Elisha chose to follow, not Elijah. Elisha chose to follow Elijah, calling him my father. And I thought for years it was just an expression of respect. But he understood and saw how that he became, he plowed, burnt his plow, he closed the doors behind him, and he decided, I'm going to follow you. And Elijah kept saying, get away from me. Why do you keep following? What do you want from me? He kept on following his, I will not. He was determined. He, would, he was dedicated and committed to his spiritual father. So when the time came for Elijah to go, he said, what do you want from me, because a father can give to a son, just like Jacob and Esau, their father, Isaac, gave, blessed in his blind state, the wrong son, and couldn't take it back and redo it, because God goes right behind that which the father gives. There's an impartation from a father. Do you understand what I'm telling you? So Elijah said, what do you want from me? He had something to give, but Elisha wanted more than Elijah to give. He said, I want twice what you have. He said, I don't have it to give, but if I go up and I'll ask the Father, if you see on my mantle, it'll God's grant to double what I have. So Elisha already had his anointing. Now he had twice Elijah's anointing. Now Elisha himself had two prophetic schools, just like Elijah. He had two groups of 40. And he had also had a spiritual son called Gehazi. Gehazi wasn't as dedicated as Elisha was because when Naaman came in his situation and God specifically didn't want Naaman to think that he could buy the miracles and wanted to make an everlasting testimony. And so Elisha didn't even come out of his house, didn't take money. But then Gehazi in his youthful ignorance went after him and got some clothing and some money. And that wasn't the worst thing in the world to happen. Listen to me carefully. Because when he hid the clothing, the money away and came back to Elisha, Elisha said, where have you been? He said, I was here and there and everywhere. And then Elisha said these words to him. Was not my heart with you. Now the danger or the sadness was that Gehazi's heart was not with Elisha. There was the issue. The sonship was lost. So he was sent away with leprosy, like Naaman's, which was cured because not long after that he was with the king. And when the Shunammite woman came back some years later, and so he was healed. He couldn't be with the king unless the leprosy was healed. But he was never restored to Elisha. It was so dramatically sad that when Elisha died and they put his body into a, into a tomb, years later while he was in bone form, in a hurry while being attacked, they put another dead person on top of his bones. His bones, he was dead a while ago, he came back to life. He had no one to give what he had passed it on to. So he had no son to pass it on to. He had prophetic disciples, but no son. I think you're getting some of that. Now, the last verse in the Old Testament says that when the spirit of Elijah comes, he restored the hearts of the fathers, the sons, and the sons to the fathers. And when the angel came and spoke to John the Baptist's father, he said the spirit of Elijah will be upon him, and he restored the hearts of the fathers and the sons. So it was always God's plan to bring back the fatherhood and the sonship in the church. Because they contend with the enemy at the gates. Because when it comes to war, true spiritual sonships, and there are those here that don't want to leave. It's not because it's a good church and only a community. I've watched spiritual sons in the house. They don't even know what it means, but they are they, they actually living it out. I can see it in this church. So it's not an uncommon thing, and they reproduce who the leadership are, and that's why this church is so healthy and strong and so actually powerful. Because the parents of this house have reproduced, and those sons will be reproduced of themselves, and so will go on, and that's how God made it. That's how God designed it from the first place. Now, the devil's attacked that thing for years. That's why America is a fatherless nation. We are a fatherless people in the last 30, 40 years. People have become so divorced, has become such an epidemic that most children will grow up without fathers because mother married someone else or 
started living with or got married, got divorced from the stepfather, and they've had two or three fathers to grow up with. So when they finally get saved and have to call father in heaven, they don't know what that means. When they become a father, they don't know what it means to become be a father. And so it's been a fatherless generation. So God's using his church to bring back the spirit of fatherhood. Now, that was just a little injection, in, interjection for you. You can choose to be a son, and but there's a price to pay. It's you got to, you got to really be, you got to be the son. You got to go after it yourself. That's what happens, and God will reward and bless you for that. Mm-hmm. You're too excited. I can't stand it. Okay. <laughs> so, in First Timothy one eighteen, we read these words: Timothy, my son, I charge you, which is a command. It's more than just advise you, counsel you, I charge you, I deliberately impart this to you with great emphasis. And that this instruction in keeping with the prophecies. So because of the prophecies, because you got prophesied over, those prophecies have this weight, that by these prophecies, prophecies once made about you, so that by following them, them prophecies, you can fight the good fight of faith, holding on to the faith. Because we're in a war, and our faith is under violent attack, and we need all the equipping, equipping we can get. Now, we know the written word, and this God's promises strengthen. we hearing of His word gives us faith. But when you get a prophetic word, it's more than just getting faith. You are being armed. Because the whole armor of God is defensive. The only attack or physical weapon you have to attack the devil with, fight the devil, is the sword. The two-edged sword, which is God's word. When it's specifically for you, it is to arm you. Let me show you an example of how faith works or how prophecy works in someone's life that's mature. In the book of Acts 16, am I boring you? Because you guys are awfully quiet in this place. In Acts chapter 16, I don't know, we're not used to being this quiet. In Acts chapter 16, we learn about Paul who says, this is what Paul, now he's already done three missionary trips. And he calls elders together. I want you to try and put aside your sweet Lord Jesus stories and look at the reality of this now. As you grow up in church and you have all these little ideas and little Sunday school stuff, put it aside. See the reality of this man comes from Tarsus. He doesn't come from Israel. He's been 14 years in one church there in, uh, in Antioch, and he'd gone through all kinds of difficulties trying to persecute Christians. He was a very spiritual man or very much a strong Jew, and now he's become a Christian, a total enigma to his family. They can't figure him out, and the Christians were nervous of him for a long time, and in 14 years he stood with all the knowledge he had, had to learn from young Christians how to be a Christian, and finally he's sent out with Barnabas, and he goes on three Three different, three different mission trips, and he's finished that now. So now he's calling. I feel compelled. I feel this gut feeling, this urgency. And I just feel it. I've got no word, no vision, no no dream, no prophecy. I'm supposed to go to Jerusalem. And he says, I don't know. So I've got no knowledge, no information. What waits for me there? I'm totally ignorant of what to expect, except. That in every city I go to, the Holy Spirit warns me. Now, that's a powerfully loaded statement. That means in every city that it's not that the Holy Ghost is only in a city. It means that in every church, in every place where there's a gathering of Christians, somebody's prophesying. And the fact that he says the Holy Spirit's warning me, he recognizes God speaking to him through the prophetic. Repeatedly and continually. Because he says the Holy Spirit warns me. So God's using people. He doesn't run from the first prophecy, run just after the first word. He's seeing this pattern repeating itself that the Holy Spirit warns me in every city that hardships are waiting for me. Now, God often speaks words to you for a purpose. Prophecy is far more integrated or detailed or or so complicated that many times your mind can't understand it. Let me give an example. I'm really dumping a lot of stuff on you this morning. I hope you can eat some of this stuff. Prophecy is more than God predicting something that you can relate to. It is often a creative word. God will speak something into being. God calls things that are not as if they were. Gideon, you're a great warrior. No way. Way. Because he couldn't see himself like that. And God will speak something into you. To offset a lot of negative words spoken over you. When in a marriage, when a woman tells her husband she's, he's impatient every day and he's got all these bad attributes, then God will come along and say the exact opposite to counteract to those negative words. He'll use the power of the word to change what you've been cursing people unknowingly in your life. You understand? You'll, 
like your child, you just do, it's always behave bad, and my mother keeps telling how bad they are, and God will come and say, you're the best child, you're so obedient, you've got your blessing. I'll give you an example. I went to, a, well, this has happened more than once, but the most uh, memorable one was years ago in a little town called Hot Springs, Arkansas. It was a big church of several hundred people, and I called someone out. I don't normally call them to the front, and I prayed over them, and I prophesied words to the effect, God says, because you chose to live a holy life and do what's right, God's going to bless your life and your ministry and restore all things to you. And he, he fell on the floor and cried like a baby, so violently cried, I was embarrassed. And the church was as silent as could be. I couldn't figure out what was really going on. At the end of the meeting in the green room, one of the pastors said to me, Ed Trout, you prophesied really well, but that was off the wall. And I didn't know what off the wall was. I come from Africa 20, 30 years ago. I didn't know what off the wall meant. And he explained to me that was totally incorrect because this is one of our pastors who we fired and forbidden to be here. He still came anyway because he's having an affair. You say he's living a holy life and chosen to his right. Everything but. He's nothing but a problem for us. But now... I felt such a loser because I'd missed it completely, and, and anybody can make a mistake, I'm sure, but I, I was so young, and it was, didn't do my uh, confidence any good, and uh, some months later, they contacted me, that same church, and said, you know what happened? That day, that man went back to his girlfriend, broke off the relationship, and we saw with his wife, and it's day back in the ministry. He says, he says that he came forward anticipating you to rebuke him, as did the whole church, because he felt he deserved it. He'd been rebuked by us so many times. He was ready for it. He felt he deserved that. He was self-loathing anyway. And then you said these words, and he said he longed to be what you were prophesying. And the goodness of God led to repentance. God calling things that are not as though they were. Had it been any other way, he would have not responded this way. So I said to the Lord, that's a wonderful testimony, and I'm glad you used it and blessed the person, but you understand, it made me look like a total idiot. <laughs> that's what I said to the Lord. You know what the Lord said to me? Well, I guess if I made my only son of no reputation, I shouldn't be too concerned about yours. <laughs> and from that day onwards, I stopped caring Half the time when I'm prophesying, what I'm saying, let alone, I, can, I cannot justify it, I can't explain, I can't expound. I'm just a messenger. I'm a mailman coming to the mailbox, delivering the mail. I don't open the letter and try and understand and know your whole life and try and figure out how your house is built and why this letter's there. I have no idea. I just, I'm just delivering the mail. So, and I'm thrilled to hear, well, you prophesied. This is one of your greatest, this baby, and this, I, yay, I think so. I don't even know. I can't remember. I don't know who you are. Hello. And they come to me, and they say, you prophesied over me. In 1942, I had this red dress on. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's not possible. I'm, it's gone within seconds. I, I'm only a messenger. I don't remember stuff. And, and so it's all about you and him, not about me. I've got no, I just don't, I'm just grateful God even uses me. I'm thankful that I, that I can be used. So understand in your life how the nature of prophecy is creative, also not just predictive. It has, and it's more powerful than that, that God will give you words to fight the devil with because a battle's coming. Often I get a, people love prophecy, and I'm not always excited about it because sometimes it's like waving a red flag to the bull. Woohoo! Come on, devil, bring it, bring your best. Not me. I, I'd, rather, I'd much rather pa, your, pa, your pastor fight the devil than me. I just let them, let them do all the warfare and prayer. I just, I like it easy. I'm built for comfort, you know. Hilton's, Hilton's one of the roughest I can go. I don't do camping and rough. I'm roughing it already with the Hilton. Thank you very much. No, Andre can live in the tent. I want to live in the more, I'm more built for comfort myself. <laughs> yeah, if you've been to Andre's house, it's built in wooden stilts. It's cold. Anyway, it's really strange. Great? Is it great? He's a bush man. He likes the bush. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, <laughs> where was I now? So when you get a prophetic word, <clears throat> God will equip you for the fight. You're in a fight anyway of faith. The devil is after your faith. The devil's not, at, when he fight, when you go through war with the devil, he's not after your money. He's not after your health. He's not after your marriage. He's not after your job. When he attacks these things, he's only one thing in mind, your faith. He's saying, what must I do to you to make you think God's forgotten about you? What 
said to God, now, if you take Job's wife, then he won't serve you. He's looking for a place that Job would turn. And he's accusing the disciples. He says to, he says to God, and Jesus hears it, let me sift them. Let, let me work them through because they're a bunch of losers. Let me work them through. He, he was always bringing accusation. It's the nature of the devil to try and bring you down. He's trying to always, and so if you understand these things, that the devil's come to destroy and kill, and he's not after anything but your faith. The first time he speaks to Eve, he doesn't say, Eve, go ahead and pick the food. No one's watching. He says, did God really say? How do you know that you're really saved? And how can God allow this to happen? How come, if God's really for you, you've been tithing, going to church, how can God allow you to go through this car wreck? Why would God do that? Why, what kind of God is that? If he can just get you to doubt and fear because you go through crises. Storms are for everybody, no matter how good you are. Jesus leads you into your storms. Most Christians in this room think that you're in a storm because you did something wrong, messed up, something happened out of your control. You just felt that there was something you could have avoided. No. Some storms are designed for your life. Jesus said, not the devil, not the disciples, Jesus said, let's go to the other side. He knew there'd be a storm, and he knew he didn't take a nap. Did he mention it? No. <laughs> Would have helped so much. God leaves out those important details because there's an exercise involved. So now he takes a nap, and this, hits, this mega storm hits. Now he did say, we're going to the other side. He gave the word. That should have been enough. After a whole day of preaching, teaching, and being in an anointing, you'd think that word would be enough. Now the storm hits them, and all they can see is this. They forgot that when he said, we're going to the other side. The other side doesn't exist. All that exists now is we're drowning. And like any good Christian, you feel you're unloved. Don't you care that we're drowning? Because you think God favors you when you get a good parking in front of the grocery store. I've got an anointing of parking. Look at me. I'm favored of God. Yeah, you No, that's a lot of nonsense. The favor doesn't make things easy for you. In fact, the favor gets you in trouble. God favored Joseph, and his brothers hated him. Your favor in your life makes you walk in that office, and they stop talking when you walk in. Ah. Or they blame you for stuff you weren't guilty of, or they talk behind your back. That's what favor does for you. Yes, because God favors you. People that don't know the Lord hate it. Because they think they haven't got... Even Christians sometimes are jealous of your favor in your life because they think that they're less favored. I mean, there's Cain and Abel's situation. He ran up and he, when he saw what happened to Abel, he went to his bedroom and shut the door, banged the door, put the, cut the stereo on as loud as he could. He was throwing a hissy fit. And God, being the cool dad, walks up and says, What's up, dude? Banged the door and couldn't even hear him. He had to force his way in. He said, Don't you know if you do good, I'm going to bless you too? You always think if God's favoring someone else, there's less favor for you. Not true. He's got enough favor for everybody. You're never going to be without or less than. The devil will feed that inside of you. See, look, look at Abel. Look, that's not fair. People say God's not fair. You're right, he's not. God has never been fair. He never will be fair. He's just. Fairness is, well, I gave it to Andre. I've got to give it to Philip too. That's fair. No, not God. God is totally unfair. He, Jacob, I've loved. Esau, I've hated. That's unfair pays a man who works all day, half day, and one hour, all the same wage. That's not fair. I told God that. You know what he said to me? Well, what would you say if you were the guy working an hour? I'd say, it's cool. <laughs> when you get in the good end of the stick, it's never fair, unfair. It's only when you think you're not getting something. So when God is always unchanging, you've got to have, that, have that trust in Him. Even if it doesn't look that way, you've got to trust Him. He knows what He's doing. Because you can, you know, you can, people wonder, can you manipulate God? Yes, you can manipulate God. He loves you so much. In fact, His love for you makes Him weak. Now I got you shocked. Now you're going, what, 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 what? My grandchild, well, she's now already going to be 16, but when she's a little girl, she start trying to stop me going to the, on a mission, ministry trip, and she'll get her, she sat on the floor, got legs, arms around me, and she held my leg. You're not going anywhere, Grandpa, she said to me. And I was in a hurry, and I couldn't move. Not because she's strong, it's because I love her so much, I was scared to move to hurt her. 
So she made me powerless. The Bible says he could have called 10,000 angels. He could have. But he was powerless because his love drove him to the cross. It pleased God to bruise his only son. His love drove him in spite of our failings. And the devil hates you for that. He hates every, He's got a lake of fire waiting for him. You've have been redeemed every day, every 10 times a day, God redeems you from all your failings, and God just loves you, and he hates that. It's, to him, it's just unreasonable. He could, no angel can be saved. No angel can be redeemed. Not one angel was worth saving. You are to die for. Do you understand how much he loves you? So when the prophecy comes, God gives you what he needs, not what you think you want. He knows exactly what you need, and there's an invite. Come on, let's go get hold of the prophecy. Do the warfare with the... Now you've got to promise you, but written it down. You've got the people help, help estimate and judge and test the prophecy. Now you've got it. It's God's word. You've got a promise. It's not happening yet. Now you're warfare. Now your role comes into play. You've got a word of God. You've got to start warring with it. And I've taught you enough. I need to teach you how to warfare, how to do the warfare. And that's another whole teaching by itself now. Another half an hour at least of teaching. I thought I taught you enough for one night. Didn't I teach you enough for one day? Because I think I'm overloading you now. I can feel it. Yeah, you guys are a wonderful, wonderful church. It's a great privilege for me to be here. And there's some wonderful people here. Even my little friend back there with a the cooks of steak. Uh, I hear from him occasionally. Good man. So, are you all excited, ready for prophecy? Yeah. I'll give you about 10 seconds to repent. <laughs> I think that you know enough in this church to understand that prophecy is never designed to embarrass or in any way hurt you. It's only there to encourage and strengthen you. Ever. Always. It will do things that are questionable. But God designed prophecy to strengthen. He spent a very dear price getting you in and he wants to keep you blessed and going stronger. Now, the two things I don't need to tell you is what your name is. You should know your name. <laughs> and what's wrong in your life. You do not need me to tell you what's going on in your life, what's wrong, because you know that already. So when you come here, I'm not here to tell you what's wrong. I'm here to tell you how much he loves you. Right. And often the words will be an expression of his love. And he'll say he will expose the secrets, not the sins, the secrets of your heart. Because the secrets of your heart are words of knowledge that only God could know. And it's his expression of saying, see, I got you. Got you covered. Love you. I know everything about you, and I'm with you on your side. It just strengthens people. They usually cry because the realization of how much God loves them is overwhelming. And the older I become, the more overwhelmed I am at how marvelous he is and how full of love he is, how good God is. It's just beyond my natural mind. The older I get, the harder I find to understand his goodness and his love. It's just, just amazing. And he loves you so much, and you are the most precious commodity he has in the universes and the galaxies. He gave everything he had to redeem you, and he focuses on you night and day. You are very important to him. It doesn't feel that way. You think God should make your life really easy? No. No, he leads you right into the storm. And he calms the storm and he says, do you still have no faith? You wanted them to go into the storm to see how they'll handle it. Your storms are your friends, not food. <laughs> so you're listening. Woohoo! Andre, come help me prophesy. Andre. I met Andre, I think, four or five years ago. It was a very interesting experience. Uh, he came to one of my conferences in Africa and he was in the audience and I prophesied over him and he wrote me an email like so many people do and I don't even respond to half the emails. It's just too many. I've had so many people tell me they're suicidal. I must give them a word. and <sighs> It's not possible just to respond. To, I just, it's not. So my daughter, Charmaine, the other Charmaine, uh, looked at, saw the email and said, Dad, I think I've got a feeling about this one. I said, okay. And I responded to him, and here he is. He tells me he's my spiritual grandchild because I influenced him as a baby, influenced his parents prophetically, and he told me a very detailed story of how I prophesied some building his dad would buy in detail, right down to the amount of money. I, if he says so, I don't remember anything like that. But he, uh, he's definitely, and I have a lot of spiritual sons, uh, both male and female, but, and I've trained them all my life, and I've had some, some hard ones to deal with. But if ever God blessed me, this, uh, it would be this. This is my absolute, my joy of spiritual son he's a really fruitful he's growing so fast 
and he's just escalating all over the world. The demand on him is growing, just growing everywhere he goes. The people love him. And he's very mature. He's got a, you hear how he prophesies. He's really got his formulation of words and ideas well groomed, and he's careful with the way he teaches. His intimacy with the Lord is definitely an enhancement for all the church of God to experience. So I'm very pleased and thrilled with Andre Bronkost. And I just, uh, for years, I wondered how he got such a pretty wife. Have you ever seen his wife? Yeah. She looks like a movie star. But I found out they know each other since they're 14. Now I understand she had no chance. She didn't see and meet anybody else. She was, didn't get out much. <laughs> yep, he was smart. God was kind to him. Yep, indeed. Thank you, Jesus. Do you want to pick some people for us? Five, pick five. Amen. What's your name here? With just the let me stand. Yes, you can just stand. Just stand. Karen, just pick, please pick five stand. and stand. One lady there with the beautiful dress. What's your name here? Yes, yeah. Yes, what's your name? You like that dress? Josie, please stand. <laughs> All right. One, can you? Okay, there she one, is. One, two, who else? You can count. Woohoo. Uh, with the yellow there, yes. And the lady next to you, both of you. The salmon and the yellow. One, two, two three, four. The two pastel ladies. Thank you, Father. And this that's, lady, the, that's four. You want? You have a stand as no fear, ne? You come or tell. Right, yeah. And that's our home here, language. Human thinks we're English speaking. Human and I are not English speaking. Yeah, we speak Afrikaans. Yeah, ons huis taal is Afrikaans. And the first one, you with Afrikaans verstaan, so can you not come from noem nie, want you have a stand, 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 you Bianca, say first time. Say first time, yeah. And the other one, we also have two people who are standing in Afrikaans. Where is Bianca? Yeah. We got the Bianca. Yeah, so she's here. She understands what I'm saying. So what is your name? Josephine. Josephine. Yes. Are you married, Josephine? Yes, I am. Do you know his name? Thomas. Thomas. And how long are you married to Thomas? 36 years. Wow, that's a long time. He doesn't doubt, though, does he? He's not a doubter like <laughs> no. Thomas in the Bible. No. And what do you do, young, young lady? I am, I have a women's ministry. Yes. And that's what I'm doing. And are you in this church at all? Yes, the one in North Augusta, one, the ministry. This is was the, word, the first word that jumped up in my spirit was that God wants you to leave all the stuff that you've known ministry-wise behind you now. That he wants to embrace this new freshness because God is doing you good. He's actually delivering you yes. from the spirit of control, the spirit of judgment. And you just, no matter how hard you tried, you couldn't please him. There's always someone putting you down, pushing you down, trying to stop you, threatened by you. They used you when you could help and bless them, but they backstabbed, the same ones backstabbed you when it didn't work for them anymore. So God brought you into a place of safety. People that are spiritual, cutting edge, that will protect you and be true family to you without any agenda whatsoever. You are safe. Now, as a sign to you that the Lord's not only with you and that it's a new chapter of your life and that I'm speaking God's word, as a sign to you, there's been an ailment in your body that's been discom discomfort for you for a while now, and it seems to be getting worse. But when you leave this building, a process will begin of healing. He will use the medical industry to help you as well as, but it will predominantly be the hand of God that's going to fix and heal you. He says, I'm to make it very clear for you that there is a beginning and an end of your natural life, but your end of your life is still very far away, and you need to know that some of the best years of your ministry life are only still unfolding now. But it will take on a whole different format, a whole different image, a whole different way. That's why God had to deliver you. He did you a lot of good setting you free from that whole old pattern and old ways. You tried. I mean, you did your very best. You just could never please them all. It was a hard job. And then there was such a spirit of control. Yeah, you will never be controlled. Never. Okay, you'll Jesus. have the freedom and you'll be loved for who you are. And they will be there to protect you and help you and, and give you the strength you need. But you have a wonderful ministry. There's no question. You have a strong prophetic gift. 
strong teaching, strong preaching. You prayed for someone, your child and your family, you've been praying, God made a covenant for you. You lay, you wake up at nighttime worrying about that child. I'm here to tell you, God has sent an angel, assigned a Pacific angel to bring this task to fruition. He doesn't need your help anymore. You can now, you must let go for once and, and let go completely. Let God work. It won't be always fun for that kid, but God has to let them get to the pigs and get to the end of themselves before they can really turn. They've turned once before and they didn't stay turned. He's going to make sure they turn completely and become fruitful trees as God promised you years ago when they were just little kids. Thank you, Jesus. Right? Yes. Hallelujah. Thank Anything you, say to me? you start? Um, I want to uh, just confirm the uh, thing with your children, specifically the burden that you have with your, with your children, that God is uh, lifting that burden and drawing your children back to Him right now. Okay. Thank you. What's your name? Karen. Hi, Karen. Hello. Are you married? I am not. Would you like to be? I would. Just yeah. point and click. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you do, Karen? I um, do not work at this time. You're but, a pastor? Um, I am not. Because that's what they I'm do. I'm not. I, um, I, I sit with an elderly lady and then just do whatever the Lord, yeah. Okay, yeah. Here's, the, here's the deal. A couple of things I must tell you. The first thing is... You're a strong-willed woman, or so it seems. Yeah. But a lot of it is a shield to hide how you really feel inside because you've, been, you've gone down hopeless and desperate streets already now in your life. And the Lord says, I must tell you these words. You are good enough, and you are a good catch. Do you understand? There's nothing wrong with you. It's the only need one. It's got to be the right one. Now, you do scare them because you are so capable. Most men are threatened by a strong, capable woman. So God says it's a little wise to be not as smart sometimes, to <laughs> not always be right. Don't always be right. Don't ever say, I told you. Ooh, no, 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 no. Even let them make the mistake. Let them go down the wrong road. Let them do the wrong thing. Let them make the mistake, and God will bless you for it. They will find out when they start to learn because you have a most wonderful heart. God wants to bless you. You definitely do things for the right reason, and that's why you don't understand why people twist what everything you try to do so well, right? The second thing I must tell you is that you've started a new chapter. Grab this in your spirit. It's a new chapter, and you must see it. You can't read or, or busy yourself with this new chapter if you keep paging back and looking back in the previous chapters. And that's what you keep living. Every once in a while, you go back to where you were, and someone will come to you and even talk to you about it. You don't discuss the past anymore because there's no life in it for you. You've got to be focused on the now and not look back at all ever again. The third thing I must tell you is the Lord has severed every soul tie. And it's not just with the people you were attached to. It's even family members that try to attach themselves to you and want to, there's a strange love-hate going on with some of the family members with you. They love you, but hate you, and they're just there enough to torment you. It's almost like they get pleasure out of it. So God's cutting those ties because he wants to refresh you and do something really good. There's been an assignment to try and destroy you from inside. It's just so subtle to unnerve you. But the Lord says, I'm not going to let that happen to you. I'm taking care of you. You're safe. Lastly, God's going to take care of you financially. It's been an interesting battle. You've lost so much. You know how to make money. You know how to get it done. God got you where you were before. He'll get you where you're going again now. He'll take good care of you. It's that simple. Your turn. There's a gift that you have of word of encouragement, and God's going to use it more in this season. And you don't realize how many people are encouraged by you. Uh, to you it's just normally going out, but those words are so powerful, and it saved them from death, these words that you've spoken. There's people that's alive today because of the encouragement that you've given them. Okay. All right. Little lady in green, what's your name? Uh, Terry. Hi, Terry. Hi. And are you married? Yes, I am. Do you know who to? Yes, I do. <laughs> Can you tell me his name? Dave. Dave. And what does Dave do? He does fundraising for schools. Okay. And what do you do? I help him. You help him? I do. God's extending your years. and your family, there's been a repeated disease or thing keeps repeating itself. And in the back of your mind, even though you have faith in God, you've been wondering if that's going to be your lot and how you'd handle it. And God says, it's going to pass you by completely. It will not touch you. That's God's promise to you. You won't even have a symptom. God is going to do all that for you. Just let it pass by. 
you're carrying burdens and worry way too much things that are not your concerns. You need to shake it off and not be worrying about things you've been worrying about. You just too too detailed, too perfectionist, too concerned. You need to relax and breathe a little, have a little fun. You need to uh, give yourself that break because you're hard on yourself, always pushing that much harder. But you're a blessing. You've, you've been specifically praying for a person in your family for quite a while now, and God has heard your prayers. He wants to affirm and confirm and make clear to you, got you, got your back. I want to make you aware of the breakthrough that you've been waiting for. There's a breakthrough that you've given up upon, and God is saying he's going to do that, he's going to bring that. Um, I sense that you know, I hear the thing you're doing with the, with the children at schools, but I see you feeding people as well, both you and your husband. I see how God is using you in the community to affect and to change people's lives. All right. What's your name, Lady Peachy? Annie. Annie. Got Green Gables. <laughs> Are you married, Annie? Yes. And what's his name? Joey. Joey. What does Joey do? He is an aircraft mate. knocking on several doors and God's got some brand new promotion coming his way just he's waiting for it so long just be patient because God knows what he's doing he needs to trust him that the Lord is in control he needs to know that and so as for you God delights in you he wants you to know you exactly where he wants you to be you at home you've, you've you're not going you're not leaving here again you're not you're not that you always feel like you can't get settled long enough but you will this is your home and God's gonna bless you here you can not unpack the boxes, but you can get more settled where you are. You're just keeping it enough not too deep that you don't get too attached. And that's not true. You need to let it go because you're, you're home. God wants you to, his name is I am. Not I'm going to be, not I was, just here now. And do it now. And God loves you. You can't please everybody. It's been a hard task to try and please everybody in your family. My Lord, it's always someone moaning, complaining, and just never good enough. And God says you are such a delight to him because you're very unselfish and you're gracious. And God appreciates that. You have this shutdown mode when you get hurt or offended or something happens to you, you withdraw. Some people go outward and they make a lot of noise, you go exactly the opposite. And, and the, God wants to be your comfort and your strength and he wants to heal you because he really loves you, knows your heart and he knows that there's not a lick or an ounce of meanness inside of you. You always try to do everything right and God celebrates you for it. There's a new car, a new vehicle on its way to you, God wants to release and show you he's a provider for you. Amen. I see at the age of 17 how the enemy tried to attack you and destroy your life, but God has protected you. And uh, so right now, as Prophet Ed spoke, that it's lifted completely from you, and God is bringing that restoration of what happened there. There's something in the past that you're still, uh, you're still asking God's forgiveness for that, and you need to know today that God has forgiven you. The first time when you ask Him for His forgiveness, it's over, and God wants you to let go of that completely today so you can step into what He has for you. What's your name? Ramona. Ramona. Are you married, Ramona? No. Would you like to be? No. no. You don't wouldn't like to be? Well, no. Unless he's got money, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're Jewish. That's how we work. We, we, do, we do arranged marriages. They always work better. <laughs> What's love got to do with it? Do with it. Do with it. <laughs> I'm so silly. Uh, what do you do for a living? teachers with saving for their retirement okay God's drying your tears you don't cry naturally as much as you cry inside and you've been in great mourning and pain for a long time and God has moved with compassion for you he wants to heal your broken heart uh, you're a you don't get that you don't understand the lies and deceit. You don't know why. You try everything so hard. You always try to be the best friend, the best wife, the best everything. And you don't get it. And the Lord says, it's not you. You did nothing wrong. It's the enemy's come to steal, divide, and destroy. And you've got to see him as the enemy. No, no human being is an enemy. They're just tools, instruments. And you've got to shake it off. Jesus said to Peter, who was so spiritual to acknowledge him as son of God, says, he said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. He saw how the devil could use someone that close to him. So you need to, this morning, change your mind and see what the devil's been doing to you. And, and now you've got to hurt him back by letting the joy of the Lord overtake you and become your strength in great new ways. I don't know what you do. What did you say you do for a living again? Uh, help teachers save uh, for retirement. Because there's a major change coming in your career. You're going to do the very thing you were meant to do and trained to do, and it's not what you're doing now. And God's going to upgrade you and do the 
really the, put you in the position you're supposed to be. You have a natural skill to lead. You're not fast, you're not a major multitasker, but what do you do, you do well, and it's clear. There's no do-overs with you, because you do it right the first time. It's who you are. God wants you, oh, he wants you to be happy. You're too scared to be happy, because every time you get happy, something goes wrong. So take a chance today. He said, I must tell you, he wants you to be happy. Don't be afraid. I've got you in the palm of my hands. It's a brand new day. God's going to fill your life to overflowing, spilling over with joy. That's God's target for you. There's a, a reconciliation of relationship that's been strained, that you love so much, you care about them, but they keep in a distance. God's going to reconcile and heal, and you're going to come, become close. God's going to do it by his spirit. I see you connected. I see the military in the future. I see a place, an office where you are in a position of authority and many people that is under you. And I want to make it clear to you today that you can do it. So I speak a word into your life right now. I command all doubt to leave you. And I pray for faith to come upon you. Okay. Amen. Thank you. Back it up. Hallelujah. Are you bored yet? No. Oh, come on. I'm just all for nodding off here. I can see. <laughs> What's your name with the orange shirt? Patrick. Stand up for a moment, Patrick. And the guy with the blue shirt, stand up, please. You don't mind. Blue, no, one behind you. One behind you. Right in the back. Sorry. I'll come back to you a little later. And then the, um, the Supremes, the three ladies there. That <laughs> <laughs> What's your name with the red... Stop in the name of love. Yeah. The three of you, yes. Could you stand up for me, please? Are you family? No. You don't even know each other? Yeah. Oh, you do know each other. Okay. Do you sing? <laughs> when I sing, it's a memorable experience. You won't forget it. Not a pleasant memory, but it's a memory. So what's your name, sir, the blue shirt? Nate. Nate? Yes. Is it short for Nathan? Uh, it's short for Nathaniel. Nathaniel. Are you married, Nathaniel? Nope, single. You are not married, and we have candidates here. <laughs> hmm? So what do you do for a living, Nathan? Nathaniel? I work at a front desk at a hotel. Okay. Hmm, interesting. And uh, Jeff, do you, do you come to this church? Uh, for the last month, month and a half. Do you, li do you like oh, yeah. it? Do you I like it? it? Here. Uh, I'm going to ask you please to forgive the church, the Christians that burned you the way they did. Even your own family. Uh, you got dealt out some stuff that wasn't really rightfully yours and you were labeled and accused of stuff that wasn't true and I don't know what it is with that because you've got a very kind heart. Now you, you get distracted. I see you, you're a hard worker but you get distracted and then you forget to do some things and, and uh, you're like an absent minded professor but you're very smart. I don't know why you're doing the hotel thing, but you have a natural engineering, natural scientific brain. It's very, you love all that stuff, and you gather, you gather electronics and everything else around you, and, and uh, you went through a very bad valley in your life of despair. But you'll never go down that road again, never. It's not who you are. You've got a kind heart. Uh, you're not the best communicator, even though you work in a hotel. It's, people don't always know what you're thinking. It's hard to get it out of you, especially when you're upset. Boy, then you shut down really badly. You can't get the words out but you have the most kindest, loving, unselfish heart. You are really a jewel and a gem. And God sees that in you, and he wants to bless it. You're never going to please everybody in your family, never. It's never going to happen. Even God can't please them all. And he's perfect. So you need to not take it on yourself anymore. He wants to fix it step by step, your finances. And he's going to introduce you to your own business through the internet, and you're going to start doing well, but one step at a time. Take baby steps. Choose your friends wisely. You had an idiot for a friend that led you down a, led you down a, a wrong path and got you in trouble, got you into a mess that you're in now. So you need to choose your friends wisely. They must have, they must have an interest in God, a love for the Lord. Do you understand? Yes. The Bible says bad company corrupts good character. And you knew that they weren't doing healthy, making healthy decisions. You know what's right. Walk in it. Right? Thing? Um, there's definitely a, a, a lot of rejection that you went through, and that rejection has limited your capacity to dream. 
Um, you uh, see when you in your teens, you had so many ideas and things, but constantly people stepped on it. And because of that, you just stopped and uh, you're not motivated anymore. There's definitely a change that's coming, a new door that God has for you. But before that new door opens, you're going to have to start to dream again. You have to, you're going you're to have to pick up that potential again of what you had. And this time it's going to work. I see ideas that's coming, and that's godly ideas that he is giving you for the future and for the position that he has for you. Okay. All right, dude. Name? Patrick. Blood type. I mean, we're married. <laughs> Sally. My wife, Sally. Sally? Sally? Stand up, Sally. You like him? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> How long are you guys married? Almost 10 years. And how many children do you have? One. They don't like him that much. <laughs> God, told you to, God told you to fill the earth. <laughs> But to fill the earth. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. All right. <laughs> what do you do for a living, sir? I work full time for the church. You keep going through the shoulda, woulda, coulda. Because you have a lot of potential inside of you. And you're kind of burned and a little disappointed by things and have people that didn't do right. And, uh, and there's some records that have been against you and things that have been really hard for you. But it's all going to be fixed. Every last bit of it. That's God's promise. You're going to have a whole new life. And uh, God's going to bless you from here. He's going to bless you from this house that you will evolve and become productive in your own little business again. That's God's promise for you. And it's going to bless you. And uh, you're not going to look back and see that stuff. The devil tried an assignment against you. He's trying to destroy you. He tried to kill you and uh, in every way and just make you feel like you weren't worth anything. And you, it's not true. So God brought you to the house to be healed and fixed because the, God knew the end from the beginning and saw the potential in you. As for you, young lady... God's the light and you're a very good organizer. You can put things in a row. You always get everything going correctly. And, and you just have, a, just have a natural skill to do those things. And you have always calming people and getting even kids that are all messed up going in the right direction. And just all calm down. You have a real gift in that way. And you're a blessing. You're not going to move away from here. You are home. God's putting the roots down deeper for you. You've had some struggles in your own physical man that God is healing and fixing, you will be just fine. That's God's promise. Every last bit of it. It's not just one thing. It's been a spirit of sickness. And the devil's trying to tell you that you've got all these diseases and keeps making you mindful of that stuff. It's Don't you even pay the devil that much credit because God's going to fix it all. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead is going to quicken your natural mortal body. But you have work to do. You're a, well, your greatest gift, whether you know this or not, is to listen. You're a listener. You hear. You don't miss, since you're a kid, you don't miss a thing. You remember stuff. He only remembers half the things. You remember it all. <clears throat> you're a real listener. And you pay attention, and that's gonna, that gives you that strength. You had to fight so many battles because you weren't always accepted or embraced. It seemed like you always started out negative before you even began, and they didn't give you a chance. Once they saw you could do the stuff, they started honoring you, and that's what's going to happen now. You have some incompletes in your own studies or own journey of education, and there's some things that it's okay, but if you can just finish that, things will change, and that's what you're going to do. You're going to finish, and it's gonna, you're going to go to that level. God's going to bless it. But you are an absolutely wonderful couple in this church. God bless you. How old is your child? Three. Three. What's his name? Judah, praise. Judah. Judah's a very strong girl child. Oh, my Lord. <laughs> uh, very set ways, very set diet, very set everything that he likes, and you have to be uh, gracious to him, but you will have no problem. Your kid will be a tremendous strength, born to be a great leader. Very unique, very unique. <laughs> Not like other kids. I just want to warn you. Go. You're a, a very dynamic couple to the kingdom of God. And uh, you'll, you need to know that you'll always, always be part of that. God's going to use you in his kingdom mightily. Do you work for the church too? Are you connected to the church? Um, yeah, kind of. <laughs> kind of, because I see you are part of this as well. Now, when it comes to what you're doing right now, both of you, is you need to know that you're a vital part of this house right now. Good. Vital. And don't look at what you're doing and the role you're playing. You know, the sound man, every person in this room that is part of what God is doing is part of the end result. And you need to know every soul that's being saved, every person being touched, you are part of that. And you have to get excited by that. God doesn't look down on you. He looks up to you. He is excited about what you're carrying and what is upon your life. So you will always be connected to ministry yeah. and to God's kingdom as a couple. Okay. No Amen. food in Texas. So what's your name? First one. 
Red, red lady, red head, red hat. <laughs> My name is Rachel. Rachel. Yeah. And are you in this church, Rachel? I visit. You visit? Yeah. Because uh, God wants you to leave behind you what's behind you, kind of between the bark and the tree. You need to grab it and go with God's plan. You, God's made you very different and unique. You can't try to conform to what you think you belong to. You belong to the house of God. Wherever the Lord's really moving, that's where you belong, because you're born for that. Your life's got a lot of stuff going on right now, and it seems a lot of confusion and just one mess after me. You're going around the same mountain a few times. It keeps same old, same old. And God wants to break that mad pattern for you and do some good things and help you and, re, and just restore to you what's rightfully yours in your own. Do you understand? God lo loves you. You're a fighter. You like to fight the battle for everybody. Now let God fight for you. Let God fight for you. You were a little girl when you called upon you had a, of the Lord and you had a vision of an angel when you were a little girl. Well, you weren't imagining. It was God. God mocked you then already for his purpose. So please, let me invite you to this church as much as you possibly can because you'll feed. Don't sit at the back. You're not a back sitter. You're a front sitter. And eat and drink because you've got too much to give and you're born to lead. Right? God is dealing with a lot of fears that you have in your life. I see so many fears that you're holding on to. He's dealing with every one of them and setting you free of that. And then when it comes to forgiveness and setting people free, I see there's God is taking you on a journey of forgiveness and helping you to deal with things. You're a very hard worker, but you've not been rewarded the way you should have been rewarded. And God is bringing that reward to you. I see how all the reward is coming at once. So everything that you've done over in your lifetime, you know, of sowing and working and putting all that effort and energy, you will be rewarded for that. You need to know that. Okay. All right. Okay. Well, go to the next supreme. Uh, what's your name, ma'am? Rachel. No, your name. Yes. Oh, yes. Awilda. A wilder. Okay. A wilder. You're married? I'm separated. So, separated. Okay. Children? Yes. You have a child. Okay. And what are you doing for work? I'm a caretaker for assistant living. Okay. Uh, God's hand is upon you right now. And even for you to be here, I sense that the Lord's, the Lord's been drawing you to this place and, and to this church specifically. Uh, God's busy transforming many things in your, in your own life. Um, I hear where you are and what you're doing, but there is an upgrade that is coming. There's a, there's a level of responsibility. Same, same workspace, same place, but an area of responsibility God is placing upon you right now in your life. Uh, the, it's God's desire to, for you to have a companion, to put someone in your life. You need to, you need to know that. Um, you've, been, you've been so alone the um, last couple of years in your life, and God wants to put someone there. It's about that companionship, someone to take care of you. And will be that companion in your life. So we pray for that companion. We call that companion in. Whatever God has for you, you need to know that it doesn't want you to be alone. He wants to put that person there. It's a close friend that you have in your life. It's a friendship, um, a lady friend that you have. And God has placed this person in your life in this season. And this per per person has really been helping you to carry the burden and dealing with things. It's a spiritual connection that is there. And I also see the two of you praying together. And God is hearing, listening to those prayers and the breakthrough. <laughs> the Lord wants to strengthen you and take this tiredness that you've been feeling. You told God, I've had enough. And he heard you. He says, don't let me show you how much you can take. When you say you've had enough, I can show you how much enough would be for you. Mm -hmm. So trust me that I'm working on your behalf, God says, and making it all work together for good. You've been going through a really hard patch. It's, not, it's no secret. But this is the word, key word is through. You won't stay there. Yeah. This too shall pass. God is your strength and your helper. He's your, there's a financial breakthrough coming very soon for you, very soon. Uh, before the summer is completely out, there's already a first part of it happening, and God's got you covered. He loves you. You've been praying for a Pacific, looks like a young man of some kind you've been praying specifically for. My son. And uh, God says, I've, I'm hounding him. He won't escape because your prayers follow him night and day, and wherever he goes, I get in his face through somebody. Amen. So God's got you covered. Thank you so much. What's yes, your name? Thank you. Donna. Hi, Donna. I like your spirit. I like you. You are a personality and a character. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You have a way of saying things, girlfriend. Mm -hmm. You don't look for trouble. It just finds you. But you have the most beautiful heart. Beautiful. Just the most amazing spirit inside of you. You're a good woman. You were born with a purpose. There was no mistake when you were born. It was a happy day. Do you understand? God wants you to know that because you've had one fight after another in your life. 
but it was a happy day when you were born because you love God and you're serious about the Lord and you've gone full speed and you just couldn't please them all in your family growing up. It's everything you tried was not good enough. But God celebrates you. He waves a banner over you this morning. This is my girl. This is my girl. This is my girl. He's so proud of you. He did not deny you anything you don't have. She didn't ask. God doesn't want you to drive an old junk car. He wants you to have a brand new one. Do you understand? Jesus himself didn't drive a used car. A brand new donkey. Nobody drove that donkey before. You could smell the leather. So God wants to bless you. He's not broken. You've been very generous. You have been so generous. You know, you sound like you're, a, you're a mad and angry, but your heart is so soft and tender. You want to help everybody, and you've been so generous. And He's got you. You're safe. Um, I see you entangled in a lot of arguments constantly, and it's been a story of your life, and God is busy right now. Um, setting you free from change and people is holding you back. And I want to encourage you not to get, get involved in your arguments. Uh, for a season, stay out of that. Because it just touches an area, and I see um, these things, that uh, aggression and things that comes out, and that's not who you are. Um, I agree completely with, with Robert Ed. I sense that, that gentleness in your spirit, but the enemy is trying to attack that by bringing out this aggression. God's dealing with that and helping you not to get connected with people that speaks negatively or get into fights. There's some, uh, I see phone calls that you, you shouldn't take those phone calls. Some phone calls that comes in, you should just don't take that, those phone calls. You know exactly where it leads to. Just uh, get, God is dealing for it. Right now as we speak, God is fighting for you. He's fighting some situations in your life. And let God finish the fight. Don't take it over from him and don't get involved in that. He's going to do a great job with that. But you have to learn to stand back and let him finish everything right now. Okay? Bless you. Thanks to Jesus. You bored yet? Can I get five minutes? Yeah. I wonder where the ladies are. <laughs> yeah, you have a Mogan Do you know what that is? It's the shield that David, you call the star, but it's actually a shield. It has six points. It represents the sun, too, you know. The, the Israel of, Israelis are the children of the, of the light. Of darkness. The complete contrast. The, you know, the bond slave sun and promised sun. It's amazing. So, Morgan Dovit. What's your name? Linda. Linda. Hello, Linda. Are you married? Uh huh. In January. I'm sorry to hear. It's always a hard thing. Even if they go to the Lord, it's still hard. Death always separates us. And this is your daughter next to you. You look very similar. So I was wondering if your family. So what? And your granddaughter? Uh, outlaw. Okay. And what? What, <laughs> what, is, what is your name? Tracy. Tracy. Are you from these parts, Tracy? Who are you married to? That there fella? What's his name? Barry? Barry, like a fruit berry? <laughs> B A, it's Barry. Lord, you all talk funny. <laughs> Barry. They call it Barry. Well, Barry's with an E, isn't it? All right, so, Grandma, what do you do now, right, for your living? Do you work? Do you do anything at all? Do you kind of retired? Because, you know, this is the word of the Lord for you. You're, you've gone through a crisis, but it's a different chapter of your life. Nothing to God by surprise. He knew about this before you were born. And there's got something else for you in store. You're having the unnerving thing, trying to convince yourself that your life's not over. You've got stuff to do. But it's true. It really is true. And you must be willing to be open. You're not, you, you're not to hang out with the old people. You just don't belong there. You just don't do that. It's going to wear you down because you have nothing to talk about. Nothing. You are a young grandma. You're a young, you've got a young spirit, and you just think young. And You're a stately lady. There's no question you're very much a lady and stately about some things. And you just don't want to be a nuisance or anybody's way. Get over yourself because they all want you. We don't want to hear that anymore. We want you to, we want you to be a nuisance because you're a blessing. You have the most amazing ability to say the right thing at the right time. Just as few words, you dump the right insights. You've got such a lot to give. And it's that, those wonderful, encouraging words that people need. You've no idea what a blessing you are. People just love being around you because of it. You are not a burden to anyone except the devil. So just, you've got a new chapter. You're going to have some fun. And you are the daughter. 
God has got your number and he's realigning your life and rearranging. You've been stressing for nothing, girl. God's going to work it all out. It looks like all's caving in right now and so much is going on. Stop the raven to make you go to your blessing at the widow's house. All you see is how there's no more, there's no more ravens. No more, what am I going to do? And God said, no, nah, I've got a plan. You won't go to it unless I had to, I had to drive the one to make you go to the other. But I've got some big blessings waiting for you. God likes you. You're hard on yourself, you know. You're very hard on yourself. You're always punishing yourself for everything and feel like you're not good enough. You need to stop that. It's getting really boring now. <laughs> it's really boring. You're a blessing. You're a wonderful lady. And uh, you hard on yourself. I see you go to the store and you'll pick up something you really want, but you put it right back because you think it's too much money. You'd rather spend the money on someone else. You don't mind spending someone else, but for yourself, it, you know, that needs to stop. That needs to stop. God's not broke, poor, or cheap. Do you understand? He says, don't save my money, save my servant. That's much more important. Right? So what is, what is your name? Barry. Barry, right? Barry what? Alan. Alan. Okay. What do you do, Barry, Alan? I'm um, actually in between uh, jobs at the moment. I'm currently helping the church out a little bit as well. Okay, here's the deal. You have business inside of you. You have huge success waiting for you. God wants to just change your mind. Because you're a good man, but you get into a place of anger about some things because people did you wrong. And you're no good to God like that. You can't have success if you have any kind of uh, resentment, even though you're entitled to it, even though you're right. You've got to shake it off because you've got to walk into the new thing with such a spirit of God on you. Because you're smart. You're good at what you did. And you did right. You did not, it was not you. They try to put it on you. It's not you. It's true. But if you only love those that love you, you've done nothing more than the world. And you told God you love him and you belong to him. Now show it. Show God that no matter what they do, you're going to love them and bless your enemies. And you're going to, that way, then God can promote you. He's going to promote you at a rapid speed and bless you you're going to put up a brand new building and i see servicing some sort of vehicles i don't know what's going on there but you've got your own business you're running the whole thing you're a strong leader management and you'll have to be working for you and this is the funny thing is you won't be you'll be employing people that nobody else will because you'll give them a chance but you recognize and you and some of those guys will flake out but many of them will become so dedicated and loyal to you they'll lay their lives down for you because you've given them a chance that's what god's going to do for you but he's going to bless you here. Do you understand? He's going to bless you here. So good things are waiting for you guys. You can stop stressing today. And so, you the grandchild, right? What is your name? Katie. Are you married, Katie? I am. She sounds like she's from here. Y'all know his name? Hi, Josh. Where are you? He's working. Someone's working. Good. That's good. <laughs> and what does is, what is Josh actually do? Um, he works for a tile company. A tile? What does he do for the tile company? He, tile. he, lay, he lays tile. And how many children do you have? Three. Are you planning any more? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why you have so many children. I don't understand why God keeps dishing out kids to you. But you're a good mother, I think, is what it is. And uh, there are some changes in your husband's life that God's going to bless him. Um, I know he's a good Tyler, and he's very comfortable. He's not the man with ambition or vision. You're the one that vision. I mean, you're the push and pull up. My Lord. <laughs> he doesn't get to sit down for five minutes. You got to, you told me you're going to fix it. <laughs> but there is business that you and him will do together, and that's nothing to do with tiles. Because he's a worker, he can do anything. He just needs someone. To take the pressure, he, 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 oh, he cannot do two things at the same time. No. Don't even send the store with more than one list. Please don't do that. <laughs> it's just not in him. You can do it. Oh, yeah, you can do it. You can have a conversation on the phone, answering your person and answering his person on his phone all at the same time. You just have ability to do so many things. And you're just gifted. And God is not any less. It's just that you're different, different kinds. He's so quality, and he's so good at people, and he, he's so good at the job, and he's not lazy. He'll keep going. And your kids have the same divided. All four of them are, they have a different, different way about Two of them are like you, and two of them are going to be like him. That's what's going to happen. And they will be just a delight to you in your household. Your house will never be quiet, never be boring, and you'll never lack. That's God's promise. 
You're going to build a new house with a pool in the right time, not yet, in the right time. It's completely foreign now, but he's got it all planned. I'm only telling you this because God is going to bless you. God's going to bless you. But you have to be a team with him. Tap into his strengths and then do what you can. Because you're burning yourself out. And some of the things you're doing is God didn't ask you to do. You're doing way too much stuff that's not even important. God's teaching you to find out what's important. Do it right, okay? You're good at people. You get things done. You're a smart worker. You're a very good organizer. You can get it all done. This is the family. You want to give them anything? Amen. God is... You're at the best place that you can be right now. He's building you, lifting you up for what he has and what's, what is going to happen. Um, do you, I, I hear you praying for them a lot, and I hear your prayers that's going out, and God is hearing your prayers. There's a place that you have where you pray. It's a place that you have. And I see when you enter that place, how there's a, <laughs> immediately the glory starts to come when you enter that place and, and you start to pray. And I want to encourage you to spend time there to pray because it's really been encouraging, uh, carrying them for, uh, for a while now, your prayers from that place. You'll be moving, I um, don't know where you're living right now, but there's a shift that's coming, and it's difficult for you because you don't want to make that shift. Um, and so many people, they've been trying to help you, but uh, you need to let go, you need to move, because it's going to be a blessing to you. So see Hallelujah. where God is positioning you in a place where you're close to them, but you're still, you know, you're still not uh, next door to them, you still have that privacy of that place. But you need to make that shift when it comes, because He's positioning, setting you up, and blessing you. See women that you're surrounded with, same age as you, and how God is using you to speak into their lives and encourage them. There's a lot of words that's inside you that needs to come out, things that needs to be written, not necessarily a book, but I just see writing and things that's starting to produce. It needs to come out, needs to flow, and this is the time for that. No, okay. All right, are you, are you guys together? Family, what friends, boyfriend, girlfriend, husband, wife? Pardon? Your wife. And you knew that? Wow, and she's so pretty and you're so... Um, <laughs> don't tell me, I know, I know this one. Blessed, you're blessed. Okay. What's your name? Taylor. Taylor. What's your name? Brenna. Brenna. Thank you for marrying him, Brenna. It was a dirty job, but somebody had to do it, right? I'm kidding. I'm just teasing you. I'm just joking with you. What do you do for a living, sir? Actually, he's got a wonderful spirit, this guy. Really, this, uh, he really has the most purest heart. Now, there's a call of God in your life. There's no question. And God has ministry for you. And this is a very um, strategic place for you to be because here you will grow and learn and, and your spirit will develop. And if you don't understand this, I must explain to you that even when you're not thinking you're receiving, you, while you're in the atmosphere, you, your spirit is always absorbing and growing. And there's such a loyalty in him my sister this this husband you married is a man of loyalty he does exactly what he says he's boringly predictable <laughs> you can go to the restaurant and you can order for him because you know you know he's going to order you, can, you, know, you go through the whole menu read the whole thing and still order the same thing again <laughs> because that's his nature he's very consistent very pure hearted he has no darkness in him at all just pure spirit he comes from a lineage of people that were for pure and godly and he's inherited something from his family that's very godly you've inherited a lot of tears a lot of sorrow and difficulty and sometimes you were like the, the dog chasing his own tail just got yourself in such frenzy about all kinds of stuff and it complicated your life and you were so, were so angry and, and you almost got attached to the wrong fella and God had to set you free of that because he knew what he, what you needed he, he needed what you needed he needed stable you didn't need another excitement that was up and down up and down and more, and, and you needed stable you needed stable because you were born for greatness this is what you don't know you're born to outstanding things you're not mediocre you can't do average or middle stuff you have to do exceptional you always got to push the envelope to the max and so god had to give you an anchor that would be stable consistent not panicky doesn't he doesn't panic he never panics very calm you will still react and get upset he's just calm. you know he's upset but you don't can't tell it takes a while and that's what you needed god knew what you needed so you're an amazing couple that will that will absolutely make impact everywhere you go. And uh, it's important you know that God wants you to, to stay the course. You don't go here, there, everywhere. Just stay the course. In your own family, my sister, there are things that have been really out of order and strange. And it's not your doing to fix them. Just leave it to the Lord now. God's got a whole pattern. He's going. He's restoring so many things in your family. Do you understand? 
you're in defensive mode with them. You're trying to fix things and tell them who, that you're not guilty or didn't do this or that. Don't. Just relax. This, God will do it all by His Spirit. All by. How long have you been married? Uh, coming up on yeah, coming up on two years. That's wonderful. So uh, this is going to only gonna get better and better and better. You guys are going to be a most wonderful couple, exemplary to many people. That people will envy you. How close you guys will be. You are very talented. There's not much you can do, my sister. And you've got to be careful to make the right selections because you can get all grossed in good ideas, but you want to be with God ideas. You're a communicator. You can write. You can do artistic. You can make things happen. You're sport gifted. You have kids. You do all that stuff. And you want to do five things at the same time. Pick one. God says, I don't care. You can just pick one, but I, you can do it all. I can bless it. I'll still direct your paths, but you need to pick. Your own, make your own choices, and I'll bless it. It's that simple. But he's going to work for the Lord, and you've got to get used to that idea now because he won't do all his th- here at the, what he's doing now. He thought about going to study and going to college and doing this and try that course and try that, but really God's training you for the ministry. I think go, go. Amen. Uh, there's a, I want to say to you that God is going to take the two of you on that adventure. It's very exciting things that's waiting for you in the future, and God's going to stretch you on every level. I see both of you very competitive, and you need a challenge, and God's going to give you that challenge, but in a, in a sensitive way, but to extend or to stretch your faith, trust Him for more and to go for higher in the lives that you have. So many changes coming in the future, um, and I, I want you to know, specifically with you, you've been involved in so many things, and you're trying to put this puzzle together to find out how is this connected, how is it uh, it doesn't make sense. Everything is going to make sense at the end because God is training you right now in different levels of your life, and there's more changes coming in the future. But every place is training you for what He has for the two of you in the future and, and in where you're going. I see you camping, and I see this adventure that's happening, and mountains you're climbing, things like that. But even the natural things will have spiritual connections where God will use that to train you and equip you spiritually. Okay. <sighs> Amen. Anyone else? You're done? Amen. That was so good. Come on, y'all. Let's give them a hand. We really, we really do appreciate the gift that God has brought into this house. The relationship we've had with them for the last 20-something years has been amazing. Uh, let's all stand to our feet. Come on. Did you get something today? Wasn't the, the teaching just amazing? Yeah, yeah. You know, I was explained Wednesday night. I said a lot of times... Uh, it, Prophecy is, is a, a calling, it's a five-fold ministry calling, but a lot of times it's just accompanied with another gift, and you see that strong teaching gift uh, coming with that, that uh, prophetic gift, and it's just it's, it's, it's amazing. And so uh, let, just lift our hands right now. Come on, Father, we thank you so much for this day. Father, you are so, such a blessing to us. Thank you for giving us this gift in this house at this season. And Father, we just thank you right now, Father, for just your love for us. Father, help us to impact the world as we walk out those doors today. And I speak over every man and woman in this room. I declare that the head and not the tail, they're above only and not beneath. They're blessed and they're coming in and they're going out. They are the head and not the tail. Father, I thank you that everything they touch prospers. And Father, I declare over them physically, mentally, spiritually, socially, financially, Lord, that everything is in top working order, Father. I thank you right now that their minds are, are strong and active, Father. Their bodies are strong and healthy. And Father, we just thank you right now that, Lord, we, will, we are ready to go out those doors and do what you've called us to do. If you agree with that this morning, say amen. Bless you. Shake somebody's hand hug somebody's neck. And we will see you tonight at 7 o'clock.